So for the past couple weeks, I've been trying to find a place to work in this story about Matthew Stafford and uh, the saga that was Matthew Stafford's trade last offseason. It was actually the week of the Pro Bowl last year that didn't exist because, you know, the Pro Bowl got canceled and nobody missed it. It's the reason why we don't need the Pro Bowl anymore. But anyways, when this was all going on, I thought back to last year around this time where Matthew Stafford was on the market for the Detroit Lions. And it was weird because quarterbacks never really become available. We can talk about 2012 where Peyton Manning has neck surgery and helicopters are chasing him around Arizona because he has a meeting with Steve Keim and the Cardinals and all of this stuff that ultimately leads to a four-year hiatus of the Broncos being a shitty franchise. Rarely does a quarterback ever become available of Matthew Stafford's caliber, not even to say Matthew Stafford's like an elite quarterback by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a top 10 quarterback rarely ever comes available. And so when Stafford came available, there were so many different connecting points, whether it be the Colts or whether it be Carolina or Washington or uh, I think Denver was one everyone connected to because John Elway is the guy who always trades for the Matthew Stafford type quarterback, despite the fact that the team doesn't really have a whole lot of competence in management, but then the Broncos change their front office and all that stuff. But one of the things that I found interesting that I forgot about actually a year later as Stafford ends up winning the championship, not necessarily because of him specifically, but just because he was better than Jared Goff and a perfect confluence of events for a really talented Rams team and the Packers playing in the snow, all that stuff. I'm not saying like that trade was a changing of the landscape in the NFL. It was just a really, really unique situation where I forgot that the Rams actually offered less than what other teams had on the table, but because the Lions wanted to do right by Matthew Stafford, they took the lesser offer and absorb Jared Goff's contract in order to send him to the Rams instead of taking the better offers. So I revisited what those better offers for Matthew Stafford were. And oh my gosh, now that we have a year later, the confluence of events that followed afterwards, you know, the, uh, what's the, what's the phrase for it? Damn it. What is the phrase? Uh, butterfly effect. Now that we have the butterfly effect in place of all these different moves, holy shit, the Lions totally screwed themselves out of potentially having a rebuild that was hugely successful by taking the lesser offer. And not just because the Detroit Lions lost the gamble of the draft pick for the Rams. They knew the Rams were going to make the playoffs in the next two seasons. They just delayed their draft picks down the road so they could be in rebuilding mode for a lot of years. And ultimately... I talked about this with the Jaguars trading Jalen Ramsey and the Jets trading Jamal Adams. The prize at the end was not what they got for Jalen Ramsey, which now is the equivalent of Clavon Chason and Travis Etienne for Jalen Ramsey, which is a shit trade by the Jacksonville Jaguars or the Jets who essentially are going to get trading up to get, or I'm sorry, trading down to get Elijah Vera Tucker and or no, trading up to get Elijah Vera Tucker and whoever they get with the 10 pick in this year's draft, which isn't really equal to the compensation of Jamal Adams. What they get as a victory was Trevor Lawrence being bad enough to get Trevor Lawrence at the top of the draft was part of trading Jalen Ramsey and being bad enough immediately after trading Jamal Adams to get Zach Wilson was the trade off there. So the Lions were banking on by trading Stafford for nothing in the short term except Jared Goff, who's clearly worse than Matthew Stafford, by trading nothing in the short term that helps the team now, our prize is we have the number two pick in the NFL draft, an NFL draft that doesn't have a generational talent. Yes, that's what it kind of looks like, but we have the number two pick in the NFL draft, two first-round picks coming down the road, and we'll clear the books later on and figure out the quarterback position as we go, as they're probably going to keep Jared Goff for a second season. So I went back into the archives and looked at what the Lions passed up on. And this is according to a tweet from Adam Schefter, February 7th, 2021. During trade talks to try and acquire Matthew Stafford, the Carolina Panthers 
made a serious offer to the Lions of the eighth overall pick, a fifth round pick, and quarterback Teddy Bridgewater. Detroit opted to take the Rams offer, Carolina still looking. Also, Dan Patrick reported that the Denver Broncos put Drew Locke and the number nine pick in the 2021 NFL draft up for the Detroit Lions to take. So the Lions had multiple offers of top 10 picks in last year's NFL draft, and they ultimately opted for two lesser first round picks and a third round pick, but also two lesser first round picks and they had to absorb Jared Goff's contract. Because with all three of these offers, no matter what, the Lions would have had no quarterback. Jared Goff, not a franchise quarterback. Teddy Bridgewater, barely a starter in the NFL. Drew Locke, ass. Like, backup quarterback, ass in the NFL. And Drew Locke was a backup for Teddy Bridgewater this year, and he's going to go be a backup somewhere else next year. So all of these cases, they would have not had a quarterback. That's an equalizer there. Bridgewater, his contract would have expired after this year. So the Lions would have had clear books on the contract. Jared Goff is still going to be under contract this next year. And then they have an out after next year if they want to move off Goff for relatively little dead cap. They can get rid of Jared Goff after two seasons. Drew Locke would have just been a bridge guy. Maybe he gets benched for, I don't know, whoever their backup was. Is it still David Blau? Is David Blau still the backup for the Detroit Lions? He is still the backup. David Blau is still the backup for the Detroit Lions at this point. Okay, so anyways, the Detroit Lions would have not had a quarterback. So now let's evaluate it from the draft pick standpoint. The Lions would have had either the eight pick in last year's draft, which the Panthers had, or they would have had the nine pick from the Denver Broncos. Instead, they took the number 32 pick this year and whatever pick the Detroit or the Los Angeles Rams will have next year. And they had a third round compensatory pick in last year's draft. I believe that pick became Amon Ross St. Brown. So nice little victory there. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I believe that compensatory pick ended up becoming Amon Ross St. Brown. So nice little pickup there by the Detroit Lions. One of the things that's interesting about this, though, is the fifth round pick for the Panthers could have turned into something, but for the time being, we're just going to not really pay that much attention to it. Actually, correction, it was Afiatu Melifonwu was the cornerback from Syracuse that was picked with the compensatory pick. Uh, He had a minimal performance this year because he went on injured reserve in week two. So they basically got nothing for the third round pick at this point. Maybe Melifon Wu turns into something, but he played two games and got hurt last year. He's a third round pick. Those guys get cut all the time. Average NFL careers like a year and a half. So they didn't really get anything for that third round pick. So let's focus on first rounder for the lions and had they taken a different offer because no matter what, they wouldn't have had a quarterback and the third round versus fifth rounder didn't really work out. So they have pick, number 32 this year and the Rams first rounder next year. We don't know what that's going to end up being. Let's say they took the Panthers offer last year, which is technically the best offer. The eight pick is slightly better than the nine pick, but they're ultimately about the same. If they had done wrong by Matthew Stafford and had they traded Matthew Stafford to the uh, Carolina Panthers and they would have gone six and 11 instead of five and 12, with their rotating cast of terrible quarterbacks. If they had traded Matthew Stafford, the Lions would have then had the seven and eight picks back to back in the draft. So let's go back to the 2022 or 2021 NFL draft. First pick, Trevor Lawrence. Second pick, Zach Wilson. Third pick, Trey Lance. Fourth pick would have still been Kyle Pitts. Fifth pick, Jamar Chase. Sixth pick, uh, Jalen Waddell by the Miami Dolphins. Then back to back, seven, eight for the Detroit Lions. Now, the Lions definitely still take Panay Sewell at pick seven. I think they would have taken Panay Sewell had he been there at pick five. So he goes there. Maybe if we want to play the game of just situations don't matter here, they take J.C. Horn because J.C. Horn was the Panthers pick at pick eight, who played three games before he went on IR last season. According to Mel Kuyper, during the NFL draft, The best available prospect, though, and the best rated defensive prospect in the draft, Micah Parsons, 
was sitting there at pick number eight. And by the way, had Carolina kept the number eight pick in the draft and they took Denver's offer for pick nine, they still would have had Micah Parsons available at pick number nine. Now, maybe the Dallas Cowboys look at that and say, we have to now jump from pick 12 to pick eight with Carolina. But if Carolina was dead set on taking J.C. Horn no matter what, there's nothing you can do with that situation. Detroit's going to sit there at either eight or nine, and they are going to pick Micah Parsons. And think about how that changes the trajectory of the Detroit Lions franchise, right? No matter how great that 32 pick turns out or the, the extra first round pick next year from the Los Angeles Rams, no matter what, you walk away with all pro in his first year, defensive rookie of the year, guy who people are already saying is one of the three best players in the NFL, blue chip NFL player who could be on a Hall of Fame path because he's the best player in his rookie class. And again, made all pro his rookie year. I'm not saying that Micah Parsons is going to be a Hall of Famer, but man, he looks like the best player coming out of his draft class, bar none after the first season. Jamar Chase right up there too. I think a lot of people would take Micah Parsons with the first pick if we had to do this draft all over again. So Detroit could have gotten Penny Sewell and Micah Parsons out of the Matthew Stafford trade. And 10 times out of 10, you're trading Matthew Stafford in exchange for Micah Parsons. But now let's play that game down the road here. Say they get Parsons. Say they end up with Panay Sewell. Say they maybe win one more game next year just by having Micah Parsons on the team. And maybe they get the three pick in the NFL draft instead of the two pick. Now this draft class is already especially weak. Our buddy Blake Jude over on the podcast told us that the top prospect in this year's class might have been the fifth or sixth graded prospect in last year's class. Detroit has already had talks about trading down, but at this point you have the leeway to trade down because you've already hit on your blue chip prospects. Panay Sewell is going to be your franchise left tackle, hopefully for the next decade. Micah Parsons, if you do right by him, is going to be a star for you for the next decade, like he will be for the Dallas Cowboys. You have the leeway to trade down and accumulate assets to build around this weird construct of a team that you've created that's designed to lose but is also designed to get a lot of players and I like the strategy of getting hits on the board but ultimately the Detroit Lions are going to be defined by how many star caliber players they get on this team and ultimately you look at the roster right now Sewell is really really good he's going to be a left tackle for the next 10 years for them he didn't have I mean he was battling injury but he didn't have the same dominant type of season as Micah Parsons did. That's not to say that Sewell can't be great in the future. They also need multiple all pro players. The thing that helps the Arizona Cardinals make the playoffs is multiple all pro players at different positions. And if you point to the Detroit lions roster right now, other than Taylor Decker and Frank Ragnow, who are really great offensive linemen, also not really anyone you can point to on the lions that it really signifies that they're one of those 15 game-changing players in the NFL. Clearly not a quarterback. Maybe they have one of the rare guys who's not a quarterback that looks like a game-changer, like what we think Micah Parsons is going to be. So ultimately, I think their best bet is to take a shot with whoever the number two or three pick is in this draft class, whether it's Hutchinson, whether it's uh, Kevon Thibodeau, even if it's Evan Neal, even though they have so many offensive linemen at this point. Their best bet is to hope that one of those guys at the top of the draft is a generational talent because this is the pick you traded Matthew Stafford for. You delayed the compensation on Stafford and ultimately didn't get Micah Parsons out of this deal because you wanted to have a top pick in this year's draft. And by the way, the Lions remarkably unlucky in one score games probably should have been better than their record suggested. But the difficult part of this is do you keep if you had Micah Parsons and Penny Sewell in tow? Maybe that's easier to trade down from number two because you know you have generational talents. Now you just got to fill the rest of the talent gaps around them with free agents and multiple shots at the board with draft picks because that number two pick can get you so many picks. And in a year where there isn't a generational talent at the top of the draft, might be a great idea to do so, but just accumulating tons of picks without having any generational stars 
is a difficult position for Detroit because eventually they might trade back up in the draft to try and hit on that generational star. And if they just had picked Micah Parsons and taken the better offer instead of doing right by Matthew Stafford, Lions might be in a better situation than they are today. So that's my thoughts there. Tell me what you think about this situation. Check us out on uh, the podcast, Take It Easy podcast, available wherever you get podcasts. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check out the Slump Buster YouTube channel as well. All of that was with that link in the description to this video. Uh, Yeah, Detroit Lions did the right thing and ultimately might cost them a chance to speed up this rebuild or do the rebuild correctly and remain in perpetual mediocrity for the next 10 years.